Uh, this is the captain. Yes, what? captain. Can you see what I'm seeing? Wait a second. What the hell's going on down there? Ridley Scott's Prometheus is a lot of things. It's a sci-fi thriller, it's a horror, it's a psychological exploration, it's also a deep dive into theology, myth, and creationism. But beneath its thematic complexity is a film filled with plot holes, scientific inaccuracies, and characters that do some really dumb things. Thirty-three years after the world's first look at a xenomorph, and fifteen years after the closing of the original Alien quadrilogy, Prometheus isn't just a prequel to the iconic franchise, it's a reimagining of it. It's also important to keep in mind that Prometheus wasn't initially supposed to be a direct prequel to the 1979 classic. In fact, Ridley Scott himself described the movie as having strands of Alien's DNA, and at the time stated that while it took place in the same universe, his intention was to have Prometheus explore its own ideas and mythos. Evidenced by the dark sci-fi interiors, biological transformations, and the last person standing narrative, this is an alien film that attempts to free itself from the franchise's iconic xenomorphs to explore something much deeper, how humanity found its beginnings. However, despite its strong reception upon release, complaints from fans about there not being a xenomorph in the film ultimately led to Scott's decision to go back on his initial words. Instead of delivering on the ideas, concepts, and promise set up in Prometheus, Scott did the unthinkable by rewriting the trajectory of the alien mythos in his follow-up film, Alien Covenant, which ultimately ruined the franchise. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and is voted for by everyone in last week's poll. Today, we're going to be exploring Prometheus. While the film has some beautiful cinematography, outstanding set pieces and complex themes, which we'll cover in the second half of the video, its ambitious ideas are weighed down by the flimsy narrative, its problematic scientific logic, as well as some glaring, head-scratching storytelling failures and plot contrivances. The film opens with a blue humanoid consuming a biological change accelerant before disintegrating into a waterfall. This is our first look at the alien species known as the Engineers, and the moment we're witnessing is the Engineers setting the seeds for all human life on planet Earth. The issue is that we see the DNA break up and reform before starting cellular mitosis, but this is not scientifically possible or necessary since Elizabeth Shaw later discovers humans and engineers share the exact same DNA strands, indicating simple sexual reproduction and environment-based evolution, not complex DNA reconstitution. Cut to the future, around 2093, and a pair of archaeologists find a star map on a cave wall pointing to a distant moon known as LV-223, which they interpret as an invitation to find the engineers who created humanity. Shaw says, I think they want us to come and find them. But even if they had a way to know for sure what those circles meant and who the people in the paintings were, she never explains what it is about the paintings that indicated humans are meant to go on an epic voyage through space. Regardless, they set out on a ship called the Prometheus, funded by Peter Wayland, to try and meet their maker, putting themselves into cryosleep to circumvent the long journey. On board, we have a crew comprising of Captain Yannick, Wayland representative Meredith Vickers, who we later discover is Peter Wayland's daughter, geologist Fifield, biologist Milburn, medic Ford, archaeologist Elizabeth Shaw, our protagonist, and her partner Charlie Holloway, and a handful of others who, well, all ironically meet their maker by the end of the film. As with every alien film, there's also an android on board. This time, an advanced model called David, magnificently portrayed by Michael Fassbender, who's tasked with assisting the crew. The trick, William Potter, is not minding that it hurts. The trick, William Potter, is not minding that it hurts. But the two years of isolation, repeat viewings of Lawrence of Arabia, and the endless belittlement by his human counterparts instills a deep hatred of humankind within him. David also takes a liking to watching Shaw's dreams, but what's strange is how this is visually shown to the audience, with the dreams fully edited, with multiple angles and crossfades when David watches them. As they near their destination, David wakes everybody up, and Holloway attempts to explain how the hieroglyphics found on Earth led them to the specific spot in space, but he's ridiculed by some of the crew. Bullshit. <laughs> 
The issue with Holloway's theory is that, if these cave paintings were separated by centuries, star coordinates and positions would be drastically different to each separate culture, as they'd move and change through time. Even then, five circles painted simplistically on a wall could never serve as actual cosmic coordinates to a tiny, minute section of space, because… well, because the universe is incredibly vast. The pattern of five circles would appear all over the Milky Way galaxy, let alone other galaxies. Elizabeth also claims to be a scientist, but when asked for scientific evidence to support her wild theories, she responds with, But it's what I choose to believe. But that's not a scientific or logical mindset for a scientist. Coming down on LV-223, they spot a structure and rush to land. Holloway ponders whether the structure is natural or not, literally five minutes after saying the words, God does not build in straight lines. Which begs the question, if he knows God doesn't build in straight lines, why does he assume that he would build architectural formations? Within it, they realize the air is being manufactured, which they stupidly take to mean it's safe to remove their helmets. Even if Holloway had complete faith in the scans, no scientist would ever do something so unsafe, not just for their own health, but also because exposing one's breath to their surroundings could contaminate the archaeological sites, which it inevitably does. David then tells Holloway that he can communicate with the aliens. Provided your thesis is correct. But there is no possible way Holloway could formulate a thesis about the alien language of the engineers in the first place, as he had no reference points back on Earth, and even if he did, no expectation for it to be true. I assume that his thesis is that the basis of all human languages come from the engineers, which is not only completely and utterly unfounded and unverified by the film's internal logic, but impossible in reality. The thesis supposes that humans must be taught how to communicate, but it's actually a natural ability all humans possess. That's why we've had thousands of languages throughout history, even though for a long time humans from one part of the world could not communicate with humans from other parts. Even if that weren't true, for Holloway's thesis to be correct, all languages would have to have the exact same foundation, but they don't. So there's no possible way David could trace all human language back to one sole root and then somehow learn to speak the language of the engineers. Regardless, they eventually stumble across a decapitated corpse of an alien, behind which is a ceremonial room of sorts containing strange pots that almost look like xenomorph eggs. This causes Fifield and Milburn to freak out and head back to the ship, despite the fact that geologists also study fossils, which doesn't end up going too well for them. I mean, these guys are terrified of thousands year old fossils, but for some reason, see no problem with shaking hands with an alien snake penis. On behalf of scientists everywhere, I am ashamed to count you amongst us, Farfield, really. With the exception of H.R. Geiger's beautiful designs, the stellar cast, terrific script by Dan O'Bannon, and outstanding direction from Ridley, what made Alien a masterpiece of terror is that each of the characters were intelligent and extremely good at what they did. They didn't die because of the stupid decisions they made. They perished because the Xenomorph is a perfect organism that hunts them down. But without a true antagonist to deal with for most of Prometheus, the film has no choice but to make the characters responsible for their own demise, by putting them in situations where they consistently make the wrong choice. It's beautiful. Oh. Hey. <laughs> She's mesmerized. Oh. Oh. Back at the ship, they discover the alien is indeed one of the engineers. I, I think we can trick the nervous system into thinking it's still alive. <laughs> they have the single most amazing discovery in human history, and instead of studying the bone structure, organs, or the cells which they see changing and multiplying, they decide to jolt it with a massive amount of electricity. This scene literally serves no purpose other than to highlight how stupid our characters are. What's worse, when Dr. Shaw runs the DNA of the head they exploded, she finds that it's a 100% match with humans. She then, in a later scene, concludes emphatically that they must have created us, but that is a faulty deduction. A 100% DNA match means that the engineers are humans. Their physical features are different because they lived and evolved in separate environments than us. But make no mistake, identical DNA means identical species. That's still a massively significant discovery, of course, to find other human life in the universe, but it absolutely does not mean that these humanoids made humans through some sort of intelligent design. We then discover that the head isn't the only thing the team brought back. David smuggles one of the pots aboard and proceeds to inspect it alone, placing a drip of the mysterious liquid it contains into Holloway's drink, who unnecessarily badges him about not being human, leading to the infection of Holloway, followed by his death. But before Holloway kicks the bucket, he and Shaw knock boots, resulting in her becoming pregnant, despite her infertility. 
The catch being that the child is not at all human, but a kind of squid face hugger hybrid. It's not exactly a traditional fetus. Although David tries to hide this from Shaw, kicking pains force her to do a fully conscious cesarean before locking her blue squid baby in the medical bay, showing that while nobody puts baby in the corner, sometimes it's appropriate to put baby in the pot. What's strange about the pod she uses is that it's calibrated for male patients only, despite it being owned by Vickers and being part of her escape plan. Okay, so she lives on a lifeboat. Shaw also performs self-surgery, gets the alien pulled out violently, which would assumedly tear apart her surrounding internal organs, before the creature's amniotic sac bursts into her incision, which is then stapled shut, which begs the question, how is she still standing, let alone running, jumping and rolling around? Despite two of their crew now missing inside a mysterious alien construct, Captain Yannick and Vickers decide it's appropriate to start awkwardly flirting with each other. But then, it wouldn't make sense why I would fly myself a half a billion miles from every man on Earth if I wanted to get laid, would it? <laughs> that isn't just bad math, it's criminally inept math. They flew across the galaxy, and half a billion miles would barely get you to another planet. Pluto, for instance, is over 3.5 billion miles from Earth. Her character is supposed to be in charge of the entire voyage, yet she doesn't know what she's talking about. But then again, neither does anybody else in this film, so I guess you can say it's consistent. Meanwhile, David ventures deeper into the complex, uncovering a cryopod containing a live engineer. Now a mother of an unwanted child, Shaw walks in on David waking Peter Wayland up from cryosleep, who, on death's door, wishes to commune with the engineer. If these things made us, then surely they could save us. Uh, save me, anyway. Save you? From what? Death, of course. After an infected Fifield reappears and demolishes his crewmates, Yannick proposes that this planet was not the home world of the engineers, but a military installation, and that the structure they keep entering was a ship containing weapons of mass destruction. They put it out here in the middle of nowhere because they're not stupid enough to make weapons of mass destruction on their own doorstep. Shaw and Wayland's team enter the belly of the ship and wake up the engineer, who's a bit cranky, tearing David and Twain and killing all the others by Shaw, before taking off destined for Earth to wipe out humanity, which forces Yannick and his co-partners to sacrifice the Prometheus to bring him down. After narrowly surviving the after-effects of the collision, thanks to being protected by plot armor, Shaw manages to use her now abnormally large alien baby to subdue the enraged engineer. With 10 minutes left in the runtime, the filmmakers introduced the very element we'd been waiting for, and instead of giving us any resolution in the form of an answer, they turned the engineer into an antagonist because we didn't really have one up until that point, with the exception of David, who technically only ever did what was instructed of him by Peter Wayland. What's worse is that he's literally killed three minutes after he's introduced, and without so much as a word from him, we're left without a payoff. And don't get me started on the squid baby. The entire sequence only creates more questions about how the alien survived the decontamination process and miraculously grew to be 10 times its original size within a few hours, without food or energy sources for it to obey the law of conservation of mass. Still talking, David offers to take Shaw back home using one of the remaining alien ships, provided she puts him back together again. But curious as to why our supposed creators decided to destroy us, Shaw sets her sights on the homeworld of the engineers. The issue is, when we see our protagonist in the next film, She's dead, killed off screen no less. What's frustrating is that Ridley Scott goes to great lengths to pose some interesting and thought-provoking questions about the origins of humanity and cosmic oceans, but the vessel he uses is riddled with holes and operated by idiots. And what's the point of showing us the Deacon at the very end? It has no bearing on the plot, and there's literally no living thing left for the Diet Xenomorph to terrorize. So why is this even in the film, other than to remind us of what we missed out on? And by the time we get to the next destination in Alien Covenant, Scott continues to subvert our expectations by making a film that's even worse. The film and the ship our characters find themselves on obviously draw their name from the Greek myth of Prometheus. In this legend, Zeus the Almighty God stole far away from humanity because the Titan Prometheus had tricked him. But Prometheus managed to steal it back, and as punishment, Zeus then nailed Prometheus to a mountainside, dooming his immortal liver to be continuously eaten by an eagle forever. But this isn't the only version of the tale. Another common version originating from the Greek poet Hesiod says that the punishment levied by Zeus was sending down Pandora, a woman who eventually took the lid off the jar she carried, resulting in all evil, hardship and disease plaguing humanity. In my opinion, the movie is inspired by both, with the crew of the Prometheus acting just as the Titan, stealing back the knowledge of how they were created and being punished by having their insides ripped out, while others are consumed by the effects of a plague. But seeing as they named the ship Prometheus, surely they knew things weren't going to be going too well.
Another interesting thing about the film is that Prometheus sticks to the discussion of creationism in the abstract, but while the clear central plot alludes to creationism, the more interesting discussion goes on with David, who very much knows that he was created and who did the creating. In a conversation with Holloway, David asks, Why do you think your people made me? We made you because we could. Can you imagine how disappointing it would be for you to hear the same thing from your creator? But it turns out David can feel disappointment, resentment, and much more. And as the film progresses, he makes these allusions to overcoming creationism all the more opaque, saying directly to Shaw that he longed for the death of his father, his creator. And, well, if you've seen Alien Covenant, you know that he goes one step further to kill the supposed father of his father before becoming a father of his own. These parallels between David's anarchy against his human creators is purely illustrative of the human's response to finding their creators. After all, the Prometheus expedition was a success. They confirmed the fact that humanity was created by the engineers, but that wasn't enough. And at the very end, Shaw strives for more answers. But the divide between creator and created isn't so easy. Just as the engineers wanted to destroy humanity as they're clearly not happy with their creation, so too does Shaw, who desires to kill her creation, the alien child she reared inside herself. Thus, if anything, Shaw already understands why the engineers wanted to destroy humanity. Perhaps we simply didn't turn out how they'd expected. By the end of the film, David attains his wish of outliving his parent, and while David always acknowledged Wayland as his creator, he never revered him as a god, instead only ever wanting to distance himself from the very concept that he was created by someone so fallible. After all, David's body doesn't age, and by all intents and purposes, he is superior to his creator. A superior species, no doubt. Uh, yeah. Thanks, David. This opens up the door for debates of the post-human, the stage of existence beyond the limits of humanity, a topic I've previously explored at length in my video on Ghost in the Shell, which I'll be leaving a link to below. Here, by the end of the film, we've almost witnessed David's ascension to post-humanity. Of course, David is not the traditional post-human, as he's an AI, not a transhuman cyborg, or even an uploaded consciousness. But through his creation, it becomes clear that perhaps humanity has created its successor, and one that will not hesitate to sever the umbilical cord. What happens when Wayland is not around to program you anymore? I suppose I'd be free. Beyond creation, Prometheus is also a film fascinated by the big question, where do we go when we die? In one of the very first scenes in the film, A Dream of Shores, she questions this very thing, to which her father responds that many different people have many different beliefs. But while the film's body count piles up, we lose track of this question, with the humans we see chasing the question of how it all started, instead of how it's going to end. That is, apart from the oldest of them, Wayland himself. And perhaps we gain some kind of answers from Wayland as he's struck down by the engineer. Ah. I know. What's more, if we zoom out of the whole Alien film series, perhaps this nothing is even more fitting. With 2017's Alien Covenant becoming a box office flop, the supposed final and last entry into the series was cancelled, leaving a void of nothing hanging over the franchise itself. So perhaps the better analogy is that the creators of the series realised they no longer liked their creation and wanted it terminated, just like the engineers. Only, this time, they succeeded.